So um, thank you very much. Um, little background, I work for Liberty University uh, currently. It is my first time in higher ed. Uh, if any of you are in higher ed, uh, I'm sure that you can say sorry to me for having to be in higher ed. It's very different than what I'm used to before. Uh, I was director of purchasing at Family Dollar Stores, uh, retail before that. I was in the military for a long time. Uh, out of all of them, I would say the government, of course, is probably the most difficult uh, to, to work with, uh, but higher ed is just a little bit behind them. Um, and we'll get into that just a little bit. Uh, generally, I get hired in procurement organizations that are broken, and I come in and try to fix them. That's kind of been the history of my career. Um, I've taken several different approaches over the years. Some of them have been, been successful, some have not. Uh, today, we'll talk about uh, Liberty University and what I've done there in the past year and a half. Um, but we're not going to talk necessarily about the measurements and what we have done and how we've been successful. Sorry, we're going to talk about how we've been successful, not what we've done. So I'll throw a couple little measurements out there as far as savings goals and things like that, but we're really going to focus on how we were able to do that. Okay? Uh, I know this is not a concept that most procurement people are in love with. Uh, there are terms like internal customers and things like that that not always everybody loves. But if you want to get buy-in and you want to be successful, especially in organizations that either one, aren't historically procurement centric, or two, um, who have a bad reputation in the procurement area or a supply chain area, which happens, uh, shifting to a customer service mindset is very, very valuable. So I took this from literally my first two weeks on the job at Liberty University, and these are some of the uh, usable snippets of emails that I received. And you can tell some of them are not very happy. Probably don't sound too unfamiliar to procurement professionals in here. Uh, I took out all the bad words and protected everybody by taking their name out. But this is really the kind of stuff that, that I see when I come into a new procurement, to a procurement organization in a new position and they have a bad reputation. It's always pushback, it's always complaints, it's always why are we doing this? And truly, if you put yourself in their position and you're not procurement, let's say you work in IT or you work in marketing, your main day-to-day -day focus is not trying to figure out how much we should pay for things or what vendors we should use. It's what you do day-to-day. -day. So having somebody come in and say, well, you should do it this way is almost like when we have IT come into us and say, you have to do it this way. So believe it or not, we are the IT of a lot of organizations. People don't like us. So. This is from the past couple of weeks. So I grabbed some just so you can see that you are able to actually transition the culture of the organization that you're in. I didn't put any of the ones that are telling me how great I am. This, I left it for other people. Okay, so how do we get to this point? Now, between those two periods of time or those two snippets of comments, that's about 12 months. In that 12 months, we were able to implement five new software programs, or at least launch five new software programs. We were able to increase headcount within procurement by 100% um, from, I think we had 10, we actually now have 22, so it's a little over 100%. Some of those are brand new headcount. Some of them are actually from other departments where they had sourcing and, and procurement activity going on in those departments, and we were able to get collaborative enough with those departments that they were willing to offer us a headcount to help us and get everybody working on the same page. So buy-in, that's what we're going to talk about. So there are basically three different constituencies that you really have to look at when you're trying to get a change in the culture of the organization. One is leadership, of course, and forgive my um, referencing 80s hip-hop, but money, 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 and what have you done for me lately? So those are the two motivators that most leaders in an organization have. Of course they want the overall organization to do well. Of course they want the shareholders to make more money. Money, money, money. But that's really what you have to focus on when you're looking at motivators. And we'll talk about how to convince the leadership of your organizations, how you can do those two things for them. Second, other departments. Those are their two, two motivators. One, make my life easier. They all have things to do. Marketing folks have Whatever marketing folks do, um, IT, they're behind on projects all the time. Whatever it is, they want their life to be easier. And number two is speed up. There is a perception that 
Those of us in procurement hinder the process. We cause red tape, we make things harder, we slow them down. So we want to convince them or show them how we can actually speed up. And then your own procurement staff, and whether you're the manager of that or whether you're a participant in a larger group, one, make people stop pushing back. It's very difficult for procurement folks to be in departments that are not well liked and to be in a dysfunctional uh, kind of relationship with other departments within whatever organization you're in and getting beat up every day. A lot of buyers get beat up every day by every person they talk to in every other department and they want that to stop. And two, they really do want measurements of what they're doing. And being able to show them, hey, here's what we were able to accomplish as a group together, it's a lot of value. So leadership. You have to show a clear vision. So what you don't want to walk into any meeting with leadership and say, okay, I want to buy a new e-procurement system. That is way too low level for the first discussion that you have. What you want to do is convey the vision. What we're trying to do is we're trying to centralize procurement and save us X. And then you get into how you project that you're going to do that. You have to promise real results. It is very difficult to get leaders to go, you know what, that's a great idea. I'm going to give you $20 million to buy software if you don't say I'm going to save you $25 million or whatever it is. You have to have actual numbers. You have to be committed to those numbers. And you do have to put your head on the chopping block and say, yes, we're going to do that. And then three, you actually have to ask for support. So I kind of borrowed that one from the sales side of the house. You know, sales folks always say, well, you have to ask for the business. That's kind of the same concept. You have to ask the leadership folks for support and get their commitment, verbally, whatever, that they're going to support you. Your own team. Um, you have to set, set a starting line, a, a starting line in the sand. And you have to say, okay, today it's going to change, it's going to be different. It is very difficult to gradually change the culture without saying today is the, is the day. So if you look at any team building, there's always a point at which you begin. So you have to define that. You have to change to a customer service mindset. And we talked about that a little while ago. You have to explain to them that all of the things that are bothering them about their current position or what they're doing currently, the job dissatisfaction that they have, all of that will change if they go along with the concepts that you're proposing. And three, this is probably the hardest for managers, is you have to empower people on the ground. You have to empower your buyers to make decisions that aren't necessarily under the letter and spirit of every policy that it is that they're supposed to follow. And we have this a lot in higher ed, where we have policies in place. Some of them are truly policies that have to be followed because it's either regulatory or that type of thing. But there's also policies that we kind of implement ourselves and we put in place because it makes our lives easier or it limits somebody else's ability to screw up what we're doing. You have to be able to give people, customer service people, buyers, the ability to help people on the ground. And as a customer, take calling into Time Warner Cable, okay? If, for those of you who have, have to call into cable companies, I think they have the lowest customer service scores of any company on the planet. It's either them or airlines. I can't tell you how frustrating it is. You've probably been in the same situation where you're talking to whoever it is on the phone and they have no ability to help you. Zero whatsoever. Now, it doesn't matter how nice they are. It doesn't matter how friendly they are. If they don't have the ability to help you, they've done nothing for you. And it's kind of the same way within your own group. Other departments. The top one's my favorite. You have to accept responsibility for every bad thing that has ever happened to them. Now, it's not your fault. We know it's not your fault. And they probably know it's your fault. Not your fault. But you have to go in with the mindset that you're going to apologize for whatever procurement did before. And you're going to fix it. That one's hard to swallow. Next, you have to clearly show that vision that you've already now told leadership about and you've told your own folks about. And three, you have to quietly let them know that you have the leader's support. Now, this is a tricky one. This is where the politics piece comes in. You don't want to walk in and go, so-and-so said that you have to do this. That does not get buy-in. 
that gets conflict. But you have to let them know, nonetheless, that you do have the support of whatever leadership group or person is above them. Okay, so now you've got everybody to commit and they sit and talk to you face to face and they go, okay, yeah, we're on board. So now what? And I've broken this up into easy stuff and hard stuff. And it's kind of funny because um, Archie Manning mentioned the second one there, the I and we piece. And I'll talk about that in a second. So much like that analogy I used with the cable company, I hate being told no or sorry we can't do that. So you have to change the mentality of the folks within your group that you don't phrase things that way because that automatically puts up a barrier and that automatically gets everybody on the defensive and gets you to start to look like the enemy and that's not what you want. So this was a, one example. Can you please get this order today? The vendor needs a PO today or we'll miss this pricing. And the first one is probably how most of us have answered that question for most of our career. Uh, but the second one is probably a better way to say it. I'll let you read that for a second. Now obviously you're not going to be able to kind of micromanage your folks or the teams on how to handle this in every situation. But what you can do is you can try to start to shift the mindset into, yes, you know what, we're customer service oriented now. I know that we're all on the same team. I know the marketing person that's calling you and yelling at you. I know we're all in this together, but they're, they're really your customer. And it does take some time. It's not going to be the first month. It's not going to be probably three months where the other departments are like, you know what, we love procurement now. It takes some time. And you have to make sure that your people are aware that it is going to take some time. I and we. Uh, this is a big pet peeve of mine, and I try very hard to make sure that my folks and I do the same thing because, one, in emails, you never know where that email is going to end up. So if you, as a manager or as a buyer or whatever, if you're taking credit for everything in an email or you're not taking any blame for anything, that email will probably be seen by somebody at some point. Now, if they see one of those where you're saying, you know what we were able to do? We were able to do this for you. Even though that person might know it was you that did it, using the word we gets everybody back in that team environment. It makes them feel like they're part of it. Number three is FaceTime. And I don't think we do this enough. Spending time with your customers. Now that doesn't mean that you have to go spend time with everybody, but most buyers have either a commodity or a department or something that they support. They need to spend time with those folks. And not just email, not just meetings where they sit there and they go back and forth about, well, you have to do this, you have to do that. There actually needs to be FaceTime where they build a rapport with the people that they're servicing. Sales folks have been doing it for however long sales folks have been around. They build a rapport, they come in, they're nice to you. We don't always fall for that, we know better, but they still do it. Give advice in meetings, not rules. And this is a big one, and I try to do this all the time. It's very frequent that people don't exactly know how the procurement process is supposed to work for whatever project they're doing. So they will ask you for your advice because you're the procurement expert, supposedly, right? And it's very easy for us to say, well, you have to do this, you have to do that, you gotta fill out this form, you gotta go online and do this, whatever it is. That becomes dictatorial. It starts to feel like you're the compliance person and either you're accounting or you're IT or whatever. You have to shift that and go, well, there's a few different ways that you could do it or that we could do it. But if we really wanna get this done quickly, since I know that that's something that's important to you, I would recommend we do it this way. And that shifts everything. It makes the department feel like you're helping them and not bossing them. Oh. Ask for feedback, and this is a hard one too. As leaders within procurement, it's very important, and SurveyMonkey is a great one. If, you, if you've never used SurveyMonkey, we do it all the time. But ask for feedback from the other leaders, your counterparts, and managers, and lower level people. Get feedback upon, on how your group is doing whether it's procurement, whether it's sourcing, whether it's purchasing, whatever it happens to be. Feedback gives you a good basis for where to focus your energy next. And that's really what you need as you go through this process. So this is the hard stuff. So systems and technology, which is why we're all here to talk about systems and technologies. I guess has been nice enough to invite us. 
So it's a lot more difficult to get systems and technology through than it is to just be nice to somebody in the meeting, right? So what I've looked at here are the different types of technology and what those motivators were that we talked about originally that they will help you with, okay? So uh, sourcing and spend analytics, that's the money piece. You need to know where your money's going and you need a tool to be able to save more money. We also just had a uh, discussion next door about the benefits of e-sourcing and how they help things like productivity and labor costs and those types of things when you have buyers who are spending a lot of time filling out spreadsheets that they're sending out to people and answering questions, right? So e-sourcing to me is probably one of the biggest keys. When you're in a new procurement organization that needs to get quick wins, e-sourcing is what you need first, in my opinion. That also answers the what have you done for me lately. It gives you the ability to track your savings and what you have done to help the bottom line of the company or the bottom line of the departments that you're supporting. It also helps with measure what I accomplish. Buyers are able to see, or sourcing managers are able to see, what they've actually done over the past six months or 12 months or what have you. It gives them a quantifiable thing that they can look at and go, hey, I did this. And it also gives you the ability to do a little bit of goal setting, um, friendly competition between sourcing managers, that type of thing. That always kind of helps the team atmosphere within a procurement organization. We're all a little bit competitive, so that helps. Um, make my life easier, e-procurement and contract management. So for those of you who are not heavy contract um, organizations, that one might not be so great. Personally, we do probably five to seven contracts a day. It's a lot of contracts. That was very, very valuable for us to get a contract suite in because we had people that were just spending an inordinate amount of time trying to track all of that, trying to figure out, okay, this one belongs to so-and-so, Wait, this one is an exclusive contract, but we already have an exclusive contract for the same thing, and they have a conflict. That one was huge for us. And then e-procurement. So we're in the process right now of going through the RFP process for e-procurement. But if, if you haven't looked deeply into doing an e-procurement system, I would recommend take a hard look at it, uh, especially if you have a more decentralized procurement department where you have other departments that are doing their own requisitioning, they're doing their own quoting, that type of thing. E-procurement will help you take control of a lot of the unknowns. It lets the person think that they still have a lot of control. In reality, whoever manages that e-procurement platform can control all of those ins and outs of what vendors you're allowed to use and, and what, um, prices you're going to pay for things and when contracts are up and all of that. Uh, measure and report. Um, all of your accomplishments are anecdotes unless you put them in writing. So having spend analytics, um, having a quantifiable place where you can go to look at all of the numbers. Leadership needs it. You need it as a procurement professional. Your teams need it to be able to see what is actually occurring. Um, be audience agnostic. What I mean by that is when you publish reporting on what you are able to do, there's no reason, unless it's prohibited within your organization, for other departments to see what you've been able to help other departments with. So we've had the situation where IT has definitely been our biggest um, ally through this entire process. Marketing, not so much. So when we put out our reports, marketing is able to see how much money we're saving for IT. Slowly but surely, marketing started to ask questions. Well, do you think we could use it for this? Do you think we could use it for that? And that's a big help. And we're not going to them and we're not trying to convince them to use us. All we're doing is publishing a report and they're able to see it. Competition is helping. We've talked about that a little bit. And that, that audience agnostic piece, if you put those numbers out there and other departments can see them, you'd be surprised how quickly you get phone calls. So, conclusion, reinvent your department. Uh, pitch for buy-in. So you really have to go out and ask for it. You can't just start changing things and assume everybody knows what you're trying to accomplish. You have to go out and explain to people what you're trying to do. Three, you have to put tools in place. You can go out and tell everybody you're going to change things and make things great, but if you don't have the tools in place to do it, you're just chasing your tail. And then measure, rinse, and repeat, uh, which is the 
um, kind of the, the spin analytics and being able to see what you can measure, uh, find out what you can fix, go out and fix it, and then try it again. 